When you hear the word church, what picture comes to mind? If you were to close your eyes and picture church, what would you see? Would you see a large Gothic cathedral with the stained glass windows? Or maybe, maybe you would see um, a, a white building on a grassy hill with a steeple. Maybe you, you picture a worship band playing music and singing praises. Or, or, or perhaps someone like me standing on a stage and, and preaching and sharing the word. What do you see? The picture of church is such a vital concept to the Christ follower. If you view the church as a place, that has implications on how you participate in church. If you view the, the church as a body or as a family, that too has implications on how you interact with the church and, and how you live out your faith. So we just spent three weeks looking at some of the really difficult teachings of Jesus and, and what it takes to follow him, that, that it requires a death to self and to sin. Essentially, what Jesus taught is the person that existed before you began following him no longer exists. That person is dead. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, we read, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. And so a natural question that, that, that follows this teaching is, now what? You, you know, okay, so the old me is dead. There's a new me. What does that mean? You, okay, I, I, I'm supposed to, I'm dead to sin. I'm a new creation. Like, how does this affect my life? What does this death and rebirth mean for me? And church is obviously linked to this conversation. And your view of church has some serious repercussions in terms of how you live out as this new creation. And so we're going to spend the next three weeks leading up to Easter in a series called We Are the Church. We want our view of church to be based on Scripture, we want everything that we do as a church to be rooted in the teachings we find in the Bible. And so today, we're going to start by looking at the nature of church. What is the church? And then we're going to talk about uh, the function of the church. What is our purpose? What do we do and this is an incredibly important conversation for Christ followers. So I want to start by saying something that may challenge your perception of church. It may cause you to, to think of church in a different way. It, it may even surprise you. Are you ready for it? You don't look ready. Are you ready for it? Okay, here we go. The church is a building. The church is a building. I know, see, shocked a few of you. I heard it. <gasps> so if you're new to church, this idea that the church is a building might fit perfectly into your paradigm of church. The church is a building. Of course it's a building. I go there every Sunday. I wake up in the morning. I, I get up in my car, and I go to church. It's a location. It's a place. Makes sense. The church is a building. But... If you've been a part of the church for some time, if this is not your first rodeo, you might be thinking, um, Ben, I've heard just the opposite, that the church isn't a building. In fact, that's what I've been taught my whole life, going to church. The church is not a building. And what I'm here to tell you is that is incorrect. That is not true. The church is a building. So, this series is birthed from 1 Peter chapter 2. 
And this is a letter from Peter to, to Christians who are dispersed all throughout Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, okay? And if you're not familiar with Peter, so he was one of the 12 apostles. He followed Jesus during his public ministry, and Peter was kind of a, a maverick, you know, Peter kind of just said what he thought and, and did what just came to mind. And so, you know, he sees Jesus out on the water, and he's in the boat, and he just goes, oh, I'm just going to get out of the boat and walk to Jesus. No problem. But then he gets scared, right? And he, he starts realizing, like, I shouldn't be doing this. And so fear overcomes him, and he starts to sink, and he cries out for Jesus to help him. Jesus is getting arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and Peter pulls out his sword and cuts somebody's ear off to protect Jesus. But then, you know, a few hours later, he won't even admit to knowing Jesus because he's scared. Peter's a really interesting guy. And, and so uh, Peter, one day, he correctly identifies Jesus as the promised Messiah. And Jesus responds of Peter. He says that on this rock, I will build my church. That, that on the shoulders of you, Peter, I will build my church. So who better than Peter to, to teach us about the church and, and what it is? And so he writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 4, he says, as you come to him, the living stone, he's talking about Jesus. As you come to Jesus, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. Did you catch that? Spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, according to Peter, the rock upon which Jesus will build his church, the church is a building. But it's not a building made of brick and mortar like the, the one that we are in right now. It's not a physical, temporal Building, it's a spiritual building. And it's made up of we, Christ followers, who are living stones. We are the stones which comprise this building. So he's saying, You, Christian, you, Christ follower, you are a living stone. You are the bricks by which the church is being built. And in Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, he talks about this. He says that Jesus is the cornerstone upon which everything else is built. And the apostles, the foundation of the building. And upon those, that foundation... You are the stones that build the church. And so what's really interesting here, and this is our first point for the day. If you look closely at what Peter is saying, you are not the church. You are not the church. The church is we and not me. You are a part of the church. You're a living stone, but you alone are not the church. Together with other stones, you make this spiritual building a temple, a dwelling place for the Lord. You alone are not the church. You're part of something greater. The sum of all those parts are the church. We are the church. And this is so important because as we die to self, this, this old self is dead and gone and something new is born. We are born into something called the church. 
Our individual self no longer exists. There's no more me. It is now we. And part of this new life in Christ is that we become part of a building known as the church. We no longer stand alone. But now, together, we make up this spiritual house, this dwelling place of God. And the original readers of this letter, as they're, as they're reading this, they're probably thinking about the temple in Jerusalem. And the temple in Jerusalem is beautiful, majestic, incredible temple. And the stones that make up the temple, well... Some of them were as tall as 40 feet high. And they would weigh up to 80 pounds? Tons. 80 tons. These stones were amazing and majestic. But these stones alone by themselves were not a building. They were not the temple. In fact, it's when they're put together that they become something greater, something they could never be on their own. The church is we and not me. We are the church, and that's actually our second point for the day. We are the church. We are. See, we live in this kind of self-help culture, right? And we're all hyper aware of the fact that we are in process. We are not a finished product, but we are in process moving towards something. And I think that most of us are in touch with that reality, that we're in process. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's a healthy thing, but I also think that there can be a danger in that. So we'll look at at Jesus and we'll just think, oh, wow, like I could never be like that. I'm so far from that. We look at the the apostles and these great men and women that we see in Scripture and we go, oh, my gosh, that's so far from who I am. I I could never be like that. You know, I, I don't have that kind of faith I don't have that, that kind of boldness. I, I don't live with open hands. and I'm not as generous as they were. I, I don't pray like that. I don't live like that. I am in process. And there's so much good in recognizing that we have not arrived. But I believe that we often use our process as an excuse not to step into our reality. That they were so hyper aware of our shortcomings that we say things like, well, I could never talk to my friends about my faith. Like, I, I just don't have all the answers. You know, I, I could never mentor someone or, or disciple them. I, I, I just, I'm not there. I couldn't do that. You know, I can't teach kids about the Bible. I don't know enough about it to do that. And these thoughts prevent us from living out the truth that we are the church. Peter says, as he continues in verse 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We are a chosen people. We are God's special possession. We are a people of purpose. We are. See, Peter, he he doesn't say that, that God is taking his time crafting you into a chosen people. Someday you'll be that. You know, that God is working on you so that someday you might become a holy nation. Someday. No. 
God has selected us to be the prophetic voice of our generation. That we are a royal priesthood. That we are his special possession. A a, a holy nation. We are. So don't allow what you are not to keep you from what you are. Don't allow your incompleteness to keep you from your identity. It's time to stop living in someday and be the church today. We are the church. We're a spiritual building. We're comprised of these imperfect people following a perfect God, worshiping a perfect God. And so that's what we are. So what do we do? What, what, what is the church going to do or supposed to do? And we're going to spend the rest of today and the next two weeks really discussing just that. What is the function of this spiritual building that is the church? We, we know who we are, so what do we do? And, and so Peter, he tells us that we are a royal priesthood what is that like like, what is a royal priesthood you know do do we need to take vows of celibacy and perform priestly duties do 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 we wear a black robe and a white collar or or maybe we're supposed to be fitted with a crown you you know are, are we priests are we are we royalty are we kings and queens and princes and princesses What are we? And what are our duties as a royal priesthood? And so the reality is that we're both. See, as Christ followers, we have a priestly responsibility to our king, Jesus Christ. And the word priest comes from a root word, which means to stand, to stand. And so we as priests are to stand before our king and serve him. We stand and we serve. We're, we're set apart and we're chosen by God to do this very thing. So, so we're priests serving our king. But we are also adopted by the king. We are part of his family. We are sons and daughters of the most high God. And Paul says in Romans that the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We are heirs of the king. And the significance of this is completely lost on us in this 21st century Western culture. But this was a profound statement to the first century Jew or to anyone familiar with their culture. And it's important for us to to realize that these these Christians that, that Peter is writing to, they are outcasts. They're, they're social rejects. See, they, they uh, had to reject their God in order to follow Christ. And, and their God was, was likely one that, that their entire family worshipped, that, that their entire community worshipped, and so they became ostracized. They're, they're no longer part of society. They're rejects. And so Peter is telling them that they've had a status upgrade. That they've gone from social outcast and reject to two very prestigious positions. Priests and royalty. And this was literally impossible. This this could not happen occur. These two things did not go together. You could not be a priest and at the same time be royalty. So in the the Jewish culture, to to be a priest, 
you had to have a certain heritage, a certain bloodline, a certain lineage. lineage. That's a hard word to say. Lineage. You had to be from the tribe of Levi. And Levi was one of the sons of, of Israel, and so you had to be a descendant of Levi. You needed to be a Levite in order to be a priest. If you are not a Levite, you cannot be a priest. Can't happen. To be a king or to be royalty, you had to be of a, of a certain bloodline as well, and that would be of King David. And so I'm just throw a question out to you. Was King David a Levite? No, he was not. He was from the tribe of Judah. So, so he's not a Levite. He's from the tribe of Judah. It's impossible to be a Levite and a Judite. I don't know if that's the right word. But from the tribe of Judah. Can't, can't be both. It's one or the other. So Peter is literally telling you that, that you are the impossible See, we live in such a different culture. We live in a culture where nothing is impossible. We have proven that anyone can become president. It's now been established that you can be an NBA champion and an Oscar winner. I didn't know those went together. We have private corporations that are launching electric cars into space just because they can. (laughs) The sky is the limit. Nothing is impossible. That is our reality. That is our culture. And and so I've tried really hard to come up with a good comparison for you. I think it still falls short, but the best I can come up with is Peter is saying, you are a unicorn. You are a unicorn. I actually know someone, though, who is absolutely convinced unicorns are real. So that's not even, I can't even use that. It's a topic for a different day, though. Um, You are an impossibility. You are something special. You have purpose. You are chosen by God to do the incredible. And so we're both royalty and priests, a royal priesthood. So how do we live as royal priests? I think that Peter uses another adjective that is very helpful in this this conversation. So in addition to calling us a royal priesthood, he calls us a holy priesthood. He he also goes on and, and he says, a holy priesthood. Nation, holy, we are holy. And holiness refers to two things. The first is God's perfection. So so Peter is saying that, that God has imparted his perfection to you. And this is confirmed by Paul. Paul says that God's righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So God's perfection. But the second thing that holiness refers to is being set apart. That we are set apart by God to be mediators of his grace to the world. That that we're not meant to fit in, but we are meant to be different. We're to live as if what Jesus preached is actually true. And his message is in direct opposition to the world. That the world says to pursue riches. But Jesus says, seek first my kingdom, and all these other things will be added to you. The world says, do what makes you happy at all costs. Whatever makes you happy, that's what you should do. But Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, I don't care what happiness you might achieve, cut it off. It's not worth it. 
The world says that we should pursue fame and power. That we should aspire to these things. But Jesus says that if you want to be the greatest of all, you need to be the servant of all. We cannot be the church and look the same as the world. We cannot be a royal priesthood and live lives that are indistinguishable from those around us. I mean, isn't that one of the most common objections to Christianity? So do the people connected to you know what you believe based on the way that you live? I think most people don't know what we believe because we behave because we act because we sound like we look like everyone else so what do they do not knowing what we believe they they are kind of left to conjecture, right? They, they make assumptions about what we believe based on examples that do stand out. Like Westboro Baptist. How about that? Or, or maybe it's that Christian who judged their gay brother. Or, or the one that lied to them or belittled them, gossiped about them. And the knock on Christians today is that we're more known for what we are against than what we are for. See, I think that for most of us, being a royal priesthood means walking around correcting and critiquing the sin of others. That that we're so focused on killing everyone else's sin that we forget that we actually have a responsibility to die to our own sin. We, we see our role as royal priests to eradicate the world of sin rather than just live faithfully in this sinful world. Jesus said, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. I mean, he said, live in such a way that people might say, I think that guy might be crazy, but I really like him. He's so thoughtful. He's so kind. You know, I, I'm not so sure about her. I don't see the world the way that she sees the world. But man, I'm just, I'm grateful for her. She's so sweet. She, she's always looking to the needs of others. You know, I, I don't know about that church. I don't, I don't think the way they think. I don't believe the things that they believe. But I'm so grateful that that church is here because of what they do for our community. That is loving people to life. That is being a royal priesthood. So, The question for today is what do you need to do differently to live set apart? Are you being faithful or are you fixated on everyone else's sin? In fact, do you need to apologize to someone? Maybe there's someone that that you judged, that, that you verbally attacked, that you made feel terrible for the way that they live or the things that they do. Maybe you need to apologize. Not because it wasn't true, but because it wasn't right. They might be sinning, but it's not your role to, 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 to put that in their face. Maybe you need to apologize. Evaluate your life. And ask the question, am I living as if what Jesus preached is really true?
Not just the good news, the gospel, but the hard stuff. Am I living like what he preached is true? We need to be set apart because we are the church. It's not me, it's we. And we need to live in the reality of who we are today. Live our lives set apart for Christ. Serving him wholeheartedly and loving people to life. Would you pray with me? Jesus, this is hard. I feel like I pray that prayer a lot. This is hard, but you, you, you have such a high calling on our lives. To, to be set apart is such a challenge because we want to fit in. We want to be accepted. We, we want to be loved and revered. We have these desires that go counter to what it takes to be set apart. And so, God, I pray for each one of us here today that that would be our heart's desire, to live as set apart for you, that we would be faithful, that we would not live fixated on the sin of others, trying to eradicate sin from the world, but we would be fixated on you, trying to eradicate the sin from our own lives. We want to love people with a purpose. We want to love them to life. We want to see people far from you find you and follow you. That they would see our good works and it would bring glory to you, our Father. We love you. And we can't do this alone. So we invite your spirit to help us. Amen.